Hello, welcome to Talks at Brickstone, your one-stop podcast for research, insights and interviews on thought leadership issues relating to Africa's infrastructure, built environment and natural environment. I'm your host, Femi Aoufala. In this episode, we'll be discussing the key challenges in transport infrastructure, construction delivery in Africa. I have here as my guest and speaker today, Mr. Chukudi Ononobu. He is an MCIOB and is an infrastructure delivery specialist. Welcome, Mr. Chukudi. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, So, before we start, I'll just take you through the table of contents. Um, We're going to have an introduction of Brickstone Africa, just tell you a bit about Brickstone, what we do, and what exactly we're about. And we'll also move to the key challenges in transport infrastructure and as well start discussing issues related to his presentation. Um, then we now have a question and answer session in itself. Quick one. Brickstone is a research-based firm focused on project finance, advisory, development management and asset management. And we basically use the investment acceleration model in executing our work. And we, we, di- we differ- differentiate ourselves from the traditional consulting firm through the use of our you know, um, action-based and hands-on advisory process. Um, we focus on six main sectors, which include transport infrastructure, energy and natural resources, real estate and hospitality, industrial agriculture, power renewables, and heavy manufacturing. In these various sectors, we provide advice to our clients. We also help them to accelerate their business through our accelerator program. And we also help them in making sure that their projects are well de-risked to be able to attract the right investment they need. One of the things we are doing in Brixton currently is our deal camp series, which we started. Um, we have a program happening on the 22nd and 23rd of November 2019, in another three to two weeks. And we feel, you know, the program basically is going to happen at the Mikio, more house, the Mikio, Mikio, the more house, Ikui. And the program basically is targeted towards entrepreneurs who are developing large scale projects, but they need a bit of insight into what exactly is the life cycle, what goes on in the pre bid stage, what goes on in the contract negotiation and financing stage. And um, it's it's still it's still up for for a number of participants. You can just at the end of this presentation, you know, just check on the link below. You'll find a link that you can click on to register and, and attend the conference or the sorry the, 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 the training seminar to be a very very important one for you if you're interested in this. Now we now go into the main talk of the day. And I have here my guest, Mr. Chukudi Ononobu. Please welcome again. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, t- to start this, um, I'd want to start by going through the issues um, as regards the key challenges. And for me, um, when you accept the fact that you've got challenges, um, to an extent, you agree that you can solve the issue. And um, it's more like a solution-driven approach to things. And I would like to take Africa to start, because Africa is a stage. And we're thinking of how massive Africa is, with a, with a population of 1.315 billion, and increasing by the day. And if you think of the expanse of land and waterways um, Africa covers, putting it into context, it, it's massive. And, and if, you say, if you think we've got people and the rest to, to transport around such an expanse of land, um, it, it still falls out to be um, an enormous thing to do. And when you think of the, the benefits of um, having an adequate transport infrastructure in place, the benefits are massive. Um, there's all those things like the return on reinvestment, there's employment, um, it also encourages growth. And one major key thing is um, urban development because um, mm. 
when you think about it, um, when you have infrastructure going into the rural areas, it, it's a way of developing those areas. Yeah. Um, and the movement of goods and services and the movement of people. Um, and with, with good transport infrastructure, people can walk in Lagos and live in another state. Mm -hmm. And they can come in to walk and go home whenever they want because um, the infrastructure is adequate, it's reliable, and it's there. Um, just, just, just to come in there, um, just for our viewers, you know, to also understand, a number of them may be, you know, may not have clarity on what we call transport infrastructure. Um, I don't know whether you can ex explain that to us, what are the various modes um, from the sea, from the air, on land, and give us practical examples that we all can see in itself. Um, putting that into context, um, transport infrastructure um, in a lay time would be things in place that can enable movement. We're talking about roads, rail, mm -hmm. waterways, mm -hmm. Um, you're talking about the air, the air airports. flying by air. So, you've yeah. you, so it's things that have happened, bus stations, airports, um, rail stations. Correct. Um, even thinking about Lagos State now and the new ferry system. Correct. So those okay. are, yeah, and you could actually go down to maybe thinking of underground systems in exactly. much later years to come. So, so, so no city can actually evolve in the world without having transportation. Oh, not at all, because even if you think about it, um, the cavemen and the early men always had their own roots. Roots, exactly. Um, so, for, for me, that's the basic start. It's the most earliest you know, is, source of it oil, is, assets even, in itself. Even going down to the Roman times, you know, the so-called Appian Ways, those were things, um, modes of, or routes by which people could move around, or Correct. goods and services could move around. Correct. And it's been part of man's way. Even when you go down to things like ants, they do have parts where, wow. where, where they go through. So <laughs> That's true. It, it, That's true. It's, for me, it's a basic thing of life to yeah. transport goods and services. services. And you just can't run away from even it. Be, even, be, even before power, because oh, yes. if you don't have means of transport adequately, then where are you going to? So what do you need the power to do? Oh, exactly. Yeah. You know. And even if you think about it, um, there's because there's this debate, uh, okay, which is the more, more important infrastructure? Is it power or is it transportation? You know, in Africa, I mean, people debate about it often in itself. I would go, I would go with transportation. First. Right, okay. Because I'm thinking about it, I need to have a route to, okay, I, I need somewhere to, I would need a route to go from one place to the other to enjoy the power there. But if exactly. the power is not there, I, I can still get to my destination using a mode of transport. Correct, exactly. You, and if you think about it, when did um, power came much later in life? Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and also, I think because of technology now and the issue of renewable power has been decentralized, right? If I go into a city and there's no power, I can get my solar panel. I can still I can I can provide power for myself. Oh, I agree. Well, I can't provide an airport for myself. <laughs> no, you can't. I, no, I can't go can. and build a road because I want to come and visit my friend in Lokoja. I build a road from here to Lokoja. No. no. So typically, um, you're right. It's, it's, it's the fact is the fact. It, the fact is that you know, power is hugely overrated, right? And when we think about transport communication, there's so much. There's nothing you're going to do. No technology is coming plus your more um what is it called electric driven cars are cool you must drive that car on your road oh yes <laughs> if you like go and do you must fly that plane into an airport you wouldn't hang it in there you, you? you must land somewhere so you must you must take that that ship you must berth it in a port so these are critical things that i think as you go along explaining this presentation i, I think it's important for our audience to understand that transport infrastructure, you know, is is the number one infrastructure to create to create commerce. As you mentioned, trade and commerce in your presentation. Go ahead. Okay. okay so I'm um, trying to look at the key challenges. Um, I'm one to prefer to use the word challenges than problems. Okay. Um, and for me, I've based the, the key challenges on these six. Um, looking at project life cycle, um, mm -hmm. stakeholders program, resources, cost, and risk. Okay. And, and for me, these are the key ones. And in each of them, there's still uh, deviations, and they still align to um, 
to the challenges. And okay. I, I would want to start with the project life cycle. Okay. And for me, a lot depends on this because to me, this defines the start and the end. Oh, wow. And okay. um, when you look at infrastructure projects in Africa, and um, the challenge is why they, some of them fail, they start Correct. and they stop. Um, things that come to mind, uh, what's the business case? Um, is it realistic? Is, is it a dreamland thing? Okay. Um, because it has to be defined from the beginning of what, what are we there to achieve? Correct. Um, okay. What are we trying to solve? Because if we don't have this the question and we don't have the answers, the business case could be something that's not achievable. Okay. Um, we've had loads of projects that had good ideas, um, I call them bright ideas, mm -hmm. but it, it could not be footed down because it did not make sense maybe to the environment or um, the place entirely. Um, I recall reading about a project in uh, Iran um, a medium pound hospital was built and till today no one has walked into it. Oh wow, why? So, so um, I think where it was built didn't make sense. Okay, it's but too far. It was a wonderful place that was built but okay. no one ever walked into it. Wow. So I'm sure lizards and rats have a good accommodation exactly. when you think about it. And I think because of the political nature in Africa, um, you find a governor of a state, you know, in a very landlocked state saying that, you know, I want to build an airport. And there's already an airport, international airport, about say 20 kilometers from his state. And they know we have to have our own airport. And the business case does not economically, you know, justify that airport to be located there. But because of the political, you know, signal, the political point he's able to score, he goes ahead to do the airport. And we have played cases like that in Nigeria, where airports have been built but they're not yet used. Um, I agree with you entirely, um, and that's why you know we were having a chat. Um, yeah. I think business cases can be written by anyone. Correct. But the idea of having someone who's got the expertise to look at your business case and say it, it does not hold water at all comes in. And um, yeah. my opinion is, um, if you don't have the right expertise, you need to have people to guide you. You're talking Correct. about consultants, facilitators, exactly. and the rest. Yeah. Because you can write anything you write on paper to you is a fact and it carries weight mm -hmm, but in mm -hmm. the grand scheme of things it, it doesn't because such a business case doesn't make sense correct yeah um and going back to this project life cycle you, you've okay. got things like the funding mechanism i still believe that the, the funds for infrastructure projects okay but they have to be most people who bring the funds to the table want to see a project that makes sense, mm -hmm. um, return on investments, what's the cost long term, and what do they get back, and things, um, they're talking about the loans, and it has to be feasible, and it has to be bankable, and if the return on investment would cover the loan, so why fund the project? Um, let's say you build something that no one uses. It. Mm -hmm. It's a failed project, no matter that's how true. lovely it is. That's true. Um, that's true. The company building it would would like it because that's um, for them. It's revenue and, and it's a good track paid. record. Yeah. But it's not if it's not helping the community, it has no economic value. It, mm -hmm. It's um, it's a failed project. Yeah. 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 So at this stage of um, thinking of the project life cycle, it, it's the whole loop. You know, looking at feasibility studies. Yeah. Uh, and I think a number of projects projects don't really look at feasibility studies well. We're not talking about the 500 page document with Correct. bright colors. And yeah. it, it's what are we trying to achieve and what's on the ground and what are we trying to solve. Uh, in some cases we're talking about supply and demand, mm -hmm. um, what are the goods we need to move around, what's the current number of people in the area, mm -hmm. um, are there projection groups, things like that. Um, and even down to the form of contracts on a job or, or design, you know, these things have to be looked at at the early stage of the project. Yeah, I, I want to share more light on that design because there is this um, issue related to um, the time we need to spend to design a transport, let's say for a, like a port for example. Um, before design, you need to do a number of investigations like bathymetry surveys and things like that. But Sponsors of projects, they get overwhelmed that, oh, I'm spending too much money on design. What exactly? Can we start? When are we start? When are we starting? And that's the African mentality. It's like, 
you know, I can't be designing these seaports for over, you know, 500,000 500, pounds or a million pounds and there's nothing to show for it. But typically, there's something to show for it because you've gone through a design process and it's the design that the construction will, you know, will, the design is the foundation of the construction that construction will, will override on. So you cannot shed more light on what does it take to design a, a transport infrastructure project? For example, an airport or, or a rail system? Um, like you mentioned, the design is a key, is a key and Element. integral part of an infrastructure project. Yeah. Because if you get it wrong, yeah. then it doesn't work. And um, you look at a lot of projects around the world, you know, Designs are actually started well in advance before the project hits the ground. Wow. But, okay. but in the African context, we love a design to be done last week and we start this week building. Correct. And, and it, it gives, um, we'll come to that, but it gives uh, more like an open area for risk and issues. Correct. So you have designs that don't really match what you want or people pull off designs that did fit a different project. So the okay. time has to be the time and money has to be spent on it, and infrastructure projects are not cheap. Yeah, and yeah. it has to be said, you know, you don't build an infrastructure project uh, when you do, you don't have money. It's much better you do the studies and you shelve it and until the money comes because Correct. it can be built on a cheap. And once the design is wrong, like I said, it, it goes wrong. Okay. So things like that, looking at um, the design, the scope of the, what's the scope, what are we trying Correct. to, it has to be defined at early stage. Correct. It's not giving the room for, at some point, we'll add more, mm -hmm. but you're thinking that if I, I, I want to provide an infrastructure for, say, let's say 10 people, my projection should be, in the next couple of years, They'll what's grow. the projection? So I, I yeah. rather build for 200 than okay. for 10, because if I do for 10, in, in six months, it will be. It, yeah, it becomes a case. Of a, and that's what has happened to our roads and even our, you know, our local airports. You know, we have in Nigeria because we keep expanding and expanding and expanding. So you know, the old domestic used to be a small airport. You know, then we build another one. They will have built another terminal. But if you look at the the ideas taken by the, is it the 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 UK? Um, this airport called. Um, the main airport. The, um, are you talking about Heathrow? Heathrow. Heathrow. Okay. You know, if, if you look at the whole plans for the expansion of the terminals, they really thought it through clearly. I don't know whether you can ex expand it on that. Funny you should say that because um, I walked at Heathrow Terminal 5 when it was being built. Okay. And I recall clearly that a platform was built with no plans of usage. And, and I'm talking about 14 years ago. Wow. So a platform was built with no plans for what it was going to be used for. But they built it and left it, and now it's, it's being used. used. I'm talking about 14 years. So um, I think for Africa, we need to go from the short-term thinking to the long-term long thinking. Yeah. Or yeah, even if it's a midpoint between short and long. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, because we need to think because our population is increasing by the day. Yeah. And yeah. increasing more and more. Mm -hmm. Even the population figures we know are not very correct. There are too yeah. many people. <laughs> and we need to factor these things in. Yeah, and, that's and, true. And when you think about, in Africa especially, a project has to be thought of from point one to point one million. Yeah. The whole loop. How loop. do we... It's like a session thinking about what do we do? Correct. How do we do the maintenance? Um, what's the, Like we said, the funding mechanism. How do we fund, fund it? it? Yeah. Not initial stage. We're talking about the whole loop. Mm -hmm. Down to thinking about maintenance. Yeah. Um, how does it get handed over? Who takes care of it? Um, are we working in, in phases? Um, and it's more like a continuity thing. And um, when you think about it, you know, it, we do come to risk much later, much later. But for me, the part of integration of, a, of an infrastructure project. Um, what else can we? What else can we do around infrastructure projects? We have, you know, you think about the rail terminal in, in Abuja. There, there are no transport systems that takes you to the. To the are you region. serious? So you find your way there. For me, it's we need to think about how. Do that we is from the airports to the rail. Yes, that's true. That's the, true. The one that goes to Kaduna. Yes, there, there, yeah. there's none. So you find your way there, but ideally. 
these are avenues whereby you integrate an existing See, to a new one. Correct. And yeah. you build around them, like yeah. you, you have a focal point. So that mm -hmm. to me comes in, in the project life cycle. Mm -hmm. what, mm -hmm. what are we trying to tap into? What are we trying to create? How do we maintain it? And how do we do the cost? Mm. So it has to be a full loop. Okay. Um, and also, like you said, um, Africa to me is unique. And um, we can't run away from the commercial side of things. Where okay. we, what kind of contracts do we use? We need to think of these things because at the end of the day, you don't want to start the project and then you start thinking, I should have thought about this. Uh, exactly. Days. Yeah. You know? And that, was, that to me was a project like Cycle Side. And um, going to stakeholders, um, that to me is a key thing about who stakeholders are. Um, and, and one of the most important things I've always learned is you do have lots of stakeholders. You have MBAs, you have... Um, you still Environmental have, guys and yes, stuff. Yes, you still have the funding, the, the people funding the project. Correct. Um, you have agencies, you even have things like a National Union of Road Transport Workers can also be your stakeholders. Yeah. Where, and you also have, even in areas, you have also have the communities. Um, even when I think about it, I still think that even religious um, institutions can also be part of your stakeholders around okay. the context. Because okay. there's no hard and fast rule to who stakeholders are. Mm -hmm. But they still come at different levels. Um, what powers do they have? What influence do they have? Because part of your stakeholders could be ones giving you your concessions, your, yeah. your waivers and things. The right of so way. I, and yeah, cool. exactly. Right of way. And when you think about it, you have to weigh, how do I communicate with them? Because uh, that's why I'm thinking communication mm -hmm. strategy. How do, okay. you, do you inform them? Do you have them as part of the people producing your document mm -hmm. because um, one key thing is you always need to carry your stakeholders along yeah. and you know the ones that are more of a problem like everything mm -hmm. that some are more of a priority to you than others mm -hmm. and you can imagine a project whereby you have a very strong powerful and influential stakeholder mm -hmm. and you don't carry them along yeah. at the end of the day they will be there to meet up with you and then That's you true. don't get what you want and that means you have a good project and you can haven't had any headway at all. Yeah. So, so for example, I mean, if, if you look at the, the real, like like developing a real line and, you know, from like in Lagos to Kano and things, and you look at the number of um, right of way, I mean, the land you pass, the farmlands, the agriculture, you know, the farms, you have to, you know, compensate. Um, so early in the stage, right from the design, right, and as you mentioned, you should have seen the line you know the the project is cutting across and if you feel that you know this 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 um the pathway for the project or the rail line or the road network is going to be huge you know why don't we just tweak the design now to you know to avert a, a, lot, a lot less disruption you know in the environment because you know by the time you look at how many houses we are putting down vessels how much we are paying as compensation then we as well you know look at the whole project all over again so stakeholder is key but the key thing about for me in in terms of let me use the word concessioning authority so when you look at a concession authority like ministry of works and power or ministry of works and uh, housing yes sir. they are in charge of roads and things or ministry of transportation sometimes you find that they are not of a certain level of knowledge to be able to engage with a private sector investor not because they don't know or what to do, but they always want to just protect the government by all means, which is not a bad thing. But you know, in a in an infrastructure project like this, there has to be a mixed cherry. There has to be like a win-win at the end of the day. Nobody should leave the table, you know, losing so much than the other. So the point is, with your stakeholders in Africa and communicating with them, the stakeholders too, or the the concession authority too, should also have their own kind of like um, structure on ground that oh have you thought about this have you done your EIA have you done this and things like that so that it helps because in the US you know in, or in, in most countries in Europe developing any major infrastructure project you need to check box there's a check box this this have you done 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 this? so we need to have that kind of standard form where you could continue in, you know along this line but I just want to chip in that um what you said is right and um it still goes back to um, stakeholders, um, uh, like you did mention about the ministries and the rest. Uh, 
for me, it's more of an engagement and buy-in by them. Mm -hmm. um, and when you talk about, you did mention compensation, because ideally, if these were picked up in the design, at that stage, engagement should have gone on with the communities, okay. the religious leaders, and the Correct. community leaders saying, this is along the route which we're planning. Yeah. And compensation comes at the very beginning of a project. Wow, okay. Yeah, so there should be money in place. So if it becomes too expensive, then, you know, uh, for me, the thought of, okay, is there a real system or what? Is there money to go on the ground? Because to me, on the ground is the next big thing. Okay, because, on the ground, okay. Yeah, yeah, because when you think about it, sometimes you don't want to go tearing down through communities, mm -hmm. you know. There's still things like ancestral homes and things like that. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you... you it has the analysis has to be done. Do we go through there, Correct. or do we find another means? Because yeah. even thinking about the route by which these things go, you need to. Sometimes you think if there's no right of way, do we create a right of way whereby you're talking about demolition houses and things, or do we look for farmlands and compensate them and go through such areas? Yeah, yeah. So I did. If you think about it, um, are we at the stage of underground. In principle, yes. In reality. I think not yet. Mm -hmm. It's good we're thinking on those lines. Um, but going back to stakeholders, everyone has to be carried along and the cost analysis has to be done. Yeah. I worked on a project and it was going to um, involve demolition some areas in the community and they were going to build a new school for them. But the ministry did not approve it unless the new school was built and it's more like um, a synchronized thing, you build a new school and they move from the school to the new one. Okay. But if you don't build a new school, why would you want to demolish the, the school? Because um, just like uh, you know, in driving, mm -hmm. you don't want to impede people's lives with it. Even if it's the best infrastructure, you don't exactly. want to. Everyone has to benefit from the infrastructure. That's you true. Know, people don't have to um, go through a lot of hardship because of an infrastructure. So. As long as you get people carried in, because I'm a believer that when you inform people and you carry them along, they will do things for you. And that's Definitely. why I'm thinking of the communication strategy. Yeah, People yeah. have to be informed about what you want to do. And then, at any stage, they will let things happen for you. And um, going from that, one of the things I know for sure is um, when it comes to program. Because for me, in the African context, a project is okay to take as long as it can take. <laughs> you know, I, I have um, a piece of, let's say, an area. You know, it's like the old case of um, five men can take two days because of uh, this piece of um, area of grass. Yeah. Uh, how long would it take ten men? Ideally, if you do the maths, it should take a lesser period. Correct, yeah. But in the African context, ten men will still take the same time. Exactly. You know, and the thing is, even when you think about it, um, the less you spend, the less time you spend on a project is cheaper than the longer time because you still pay for manpower, you still pay for the resources. That's true. That's and true. Um, even if labor is cheap, you can still save five naira. That's true. That's true. So for me, um, the issue of having a program, what's the plan? What do we hope to deliver? When do we start? Mm -hmm. When do we mobilize? When do we get the contractors in? And even factor things like weather conditions and put those things into context mm. because it's at that stage you think, now I think I know how long this project will last. Uh, cool. And it's not the case of, let's just start and see what, what happened. That, uh, that is actually the, the language. Let's just start. Let's just start as we go along. And so even you yourself will be like, so sometimes you are in a cost position. So you are a client, you have a client and you are a consultant. And the consultant says that, no, we can't start. These and these and this needs to be in place. We need to have our program done out. But the employer is telling you that, man, we'll start tomorrow. So sometimes there's, there's, there's that fight, or let me use the word, that, that, that tussle between, you know, why start spending money on, and deep in the consultant's mind, he knows that this guy is going to spend his money again. But, but True. What, so, so what happens in this kind of situation? It's, it's a bit of a catch-22 because um, in as much as the consultant is hired to do a job, um, he's got to let the client know this is the true situation of things. 
And, and like you mentioned, it, it's like um, the old saying of Pennywise pound foolish. Um, because when you start quickly, and then you meet bottlenecks, which the consultant would have known would happen. Mm -hmm. What happens? It takes longer to get the job done, and then that eats into, for me, the cost of the project. And that's how projects cost a lot more. Yeah. Because um, let's say I, I want to construct uh, a column, um, or let's go to the basic one. I have a guy who's going to lay blocks for me, and ideally I want him to lay 200 blocks a day. At that stage, I can think 200 blocks a day, I know what I'll get in five days yeah and i can go from that yeah in the case of telling someone just lay as much as you can i, I would lay two blocks a year a day exactly yeah and but the thing is we need to factor those things and have a have in mind this is what we hope to achieve and this mm -hmm. is when the actual item we hope to achieve mm -hmm. by when and even mm -hmm. if it's late how do we recover? Because yeah. uh, ideally programs, you need to have things like a mitigation in place. Yeah. Uh, you need to have a float. How long? When can we push it? And for me, the biggest thing in a program is a program has to tell a story. Yeah. Uh, you know, you do your foundation, you do your block wall mm -hmm. and things like that. You don't do the roof before you build the house. Exactly. Because it won't hang in the air. Yeah. So for me, um, a project should have a, a program which is fully resourced and tells a story. Mm. And it has to be realistic. Okay. You know, so to me, that's one of the key ones because I look at many projects and roads are closed and they haven't even started. So what was the point of closing the road? It, it's, we're about to start and okay. machines land and the discomfort is there already. Exactly. You, you know, so <laughs> it happens about, a lot in Nigeria. And you think, how long is this project going to last? Many projects don't have a duration period. They do have on paper, but they always go beyond it. Yeah, it's fine, but yeah. it is, we need to have an original idea of how long it would take us, and Correct. we might have a delay. Then. Let's be. And, and, and I think also, let's even leave the idea of you know PPPs now. Um, when you look at the number of Nigerian roads, and you have government paying contractors, you know, Julius Berger, Kappa, all these big contractors and things, and the supervision authority, the supervising authorities are, are aware that this road is meant to take. 19 weeks or 20 weeks now they give you a plan i think as the public sector officer i should be able to critique that plan i say no 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 no. this is not taking 20 this is taking 24 weeks so there's a bit of capacity building also on the part of the client i'm talking about the direct contract now yeah where you're giving a contract to do a road network or a road or, or do it or renovate an airport we should not getting the sense of so the the, employ, the consultant or the contractor is trying to say ah my minister don't worry sir, i will do it for you yeah 20 weeks it is done but deep in your heart you know this is like 35 weeks to get done but the guy has now told his stakeholder you know back back to the point of stakeholder that ah don't worry this one is going to be closed only for 20 weeks now, people are suffering. Look at the Lagos Ibado Expressway. I don't know whether you've passed there recently. You know, I haven't. It's, it's mad. I mean, they've been building that road since I was in university. It's always on, on that construction. It's always on that construction. And like, can't we start and end this thing? And the, this cost has skyrocketed. It's over a hundred billion now. Even more than that, I don't even show the figure. So, you are right on this issue of programming, but I feel that there's also a lack of capacity building on the client side to be able to critique the program, to be sure that that's the client also have, maybe have his own consultant, as you mentioned, or having his own, like, what you call um, owner representative, so to say, to be sure that, yes, this is taking 19 weeks, yes, it's clear they will take 19 weeks. Don't let the contractor come and sell us a very tight program just because he wants to get the job. Um, I agree with you, but um, for me and in my career, I've always known that programs have to be reviewed and accepted. Correct. And, and an unrealistic program, the client will say it's not realistic. I want a realistic program. But he doesn't know. Oh, yes. Um, the point. He, he, doesn't have, he doesn't have the time to sit down and, and, and really critique it. Maybe it might be an issue of human capacity or human capital, but these contractors seem to always have the edge in this program because they say, I don't know we're going to do this block work. And sometimes they give you a very large program, which can be concluded in less than 10 weeks. They give you like an 18-week program. 
just because they want to earn more manpower. Oh, yes, yes. Um, yeah. it, it's a reality, to, to, to be frank. Um, but for me, it, it's a lot to do with people sitting on the table and yeah. reviewing the program. Correct. And accepting, this is how long it would take. Correct. A, a realistic um, assessment of how long it would take. Yeah. And um, part of what you mentioned has to go back to the issue. We'll come to the resources of having the... You can't run away from having the right people resources. in place. Yeah, yeah. You know, and also sitting on the table because mm -hmm. if I don't have the right resources, I, I can't analyze your program and say it doesn't sound realistic because mm -hmm. most jobs I've worked on, programs are reviewed and sometimes rejected and, and the contractor told, I want a new program. Mm -hmm. And programs are not accepted. And mm -hmm. there's always a cost implication. And like I, I, in my experience, if a job is not delivered by the agreed date, there has to be things like um, damages. Correct, liquidated damages. And if you yeah. don't have liquidated damages in place, then I could do the job for another hundred years and still yeah. get paid. Correct. Yeah. You know, so as long as damages are there, no one wants to go a day beyond beyond that. Beyond that. So these things have to be in place. In place if yeah. not, you know, how long is a piece of string? <laughs> Yeah, so right. To me, the program is, is, is a vital part of it. How long, when do we expect this project? Mm -hmm. You know, and also going back to the project life cycle. Um, for me, one key white elephant in the room is um, African projects are more like a dial. And, and the dial has to be in sync with, the, with most countries, um, what would I say, um, government you know we're talking about the regimes how often do you have elections okay. so if you have projects that overlap different um elections life cycle correct it becomes a problem and our biggest problem in africa is we are we run the government as a party government rather than a government is detached from a party mm -hmm. the party mm -hmm. serves serves the nation and not the party itself yes correct so a, a project is independent of the party in place mm -hmm. so a project still runs this course and mm -hmm. it wouldn't stop that's true you that's know true. and also thinking about you can't run away from the funding and the money has to be somewhere you know you have things like escrow account and the rest yeah so no yeah. matter who's in who's in power who's in government the project is still running irrespective of Definitely. You know, and that to me, you know, it doesn't affect the program because a lot of jobs have had to stop because there's been a power change, you know, government change and projects will stop. Mm -hmm. and, and, and also happens also from a private sector perspective where you have a PPP, where you are developing maybe a toll road and things and you're about to reach financial close, you know, where your funders and lenders are meant to, you know, disburse funds and close on the financing and there's an election close by nine out of ten they will not close they will want to wait yes. until after the elections see what happens but come on you've committed capital you know you've committed resources so and it's because of the experience these investors have had in the past from the example you've given whereby projects have been abandoned or or the kind of government support you earlier got you're not getting it again and things okay yeah. okay um Touching back on, I did mention resources. You need to have the right human capital in place, and that's one of it's one of the key things to run a project. The right amount of money can be on the table, but you don't have the right people to run the job. Yeah, very right. You need to have the right expertise. You need to have the. You can't run away from consultants because. Like they say, um, there's always room for improvement and no one knows everything. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you see people with 400 years experience. But, exactly. <laughs> but w what I'm trying to say is um, there's nothing wrong in, in accepting that I don't have the right expertise. I need to get the yeah. right expertise. And two, for us, which is even at Brickstone, one of the key things also is to know what kind of expertise do I need. You know, sometimes you find client come to us and say oh you know what I, I need to do this uh, 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 port project or something I'm like okay have you done any bathymetry surveys no I'm like what is that you know or you know um, I, I, I got an engineer he has designed the you know the layout already for the ports and things so sometimes the entrepreneur has the money he has the 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 clout to make the deal happen 
but he wastes money on the wrong people. So procurement is a, is a, is a very, very important, and that's why like having like, a project manager or a development manager at the very early stage to enable you to scope out what exactly is required. Do you get you know. Um, like you mentioned, I've worked on projects where there's always a resource plan. What do, what kind of expertise do we need? How many of them do we need? Mm -hmm. um, for what duration of the project? Because you need the right people. Um, you're not going to have one man or one woman doing multiple roles. You, Correct. Yeah, and for me, it's hard to accept. Um, not like it's hard, but when you accept, I, I don't have this. I need this. For me. It's a good way to start. Yeah, you know, that's I, true. I need the right people with the right expertise, right experience, and, and that's why you know going down to that's why you have CVs. Who who do I need? Exactly. Uh, this, this is what you need. You need the right plant and equipment. You need the right materials, um, and money. Yeah, you know, definitely. Money, money is a key word. Um, a key word. Yeah, yeah. And these things would make a project happen because if you lack these things. The project would run, but it would come back to bite you because it would cost a lot more. Um, I remember saying that it, it cost a lot more to use poor quality mm -hmm. because you still come back to redo the job. That is it. Or you still end up losing money. So what, what, what even what even comes to mind is the fact that even when you have met all this the right manpower and the right you know skill set on board for your project, the money thing easily follows because. For the investor or the early stage seed investor trying to also provide your seed funding for your pre-development work, right? He also sees that his money is not going down the drain because you've you've gotten the right people. So sometimes you find that you're not you're not you're not being able to raise early stage funding because you just don't have the right people. It's as simple as that. Yeah, it does happen because um, going back to it has to be factored early stage. Yeah, yeah. What, because um, sometimes uh, it's more of um, what's the resource and I have a pocket of money for the expertise mm -hmm. I'm going to get. And you have to accept that you need the, you need the right people in place. Yeah, right. And um, if you, let's be realistic. Um, the right expertise, right experience cost money. Yes, definitely. It, it's not cheap at it's all. It's not at all. Um, I was reading the other day about um, the new DFID project um, called UK Knife, which is an, an advisory program, um, okay. which was won by WYG. And it, it's okay. advisory to work with um, Nigerian MDAs on infrastructure projects. Um, okay. And it covers things like rail, the power sector, roads, and also looking into budgets. Okay. So you really need, um, for me, it's an advantage for Nigeria to work on these projects and get advice from it's not rocket science and I think sometimes you have to accept the fact that you need to tap knowledge and ideas from the right people mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and there's no you know when you think about it um, what comes to my mind is things like um, the platform called LinkedIn where people interact on a professional level yeah you need to tap into the right expertise that's and, true and from that's there true. you get things like plant and equipment what's the right tool to use exactly you know the man with the right experience also needs the right tool to walk. Definitely. You know, so resources, it's, it's also one of the things in Africa that um, is a big issue because um, we need the right resources to do jobs. Um, mm -hmm. Because I've been on a project early many years and, and a guy just tells you, okay, this is what you do, this is what you do. And he's been doing it for years. But anything he says is gospel. So we yeah. could say he has the right expertise, but it's still questionable. Yeah, you know, so things like that come into play. But when you look around projects, sometimes people want to save money on projects and maybe get um, a young engineer and get him to do everything. And the pressure is there. That's true. That's yeah. true. So moving on to the next one, we're looking at the big one: cost. Cost. Yeah. You know, going back, um, every project has a cost. That's true. But most projects go beyond the original cost. It, it happens in many places. Um, yeah. You, you think about it, um, what comes to mind was um, Crossrail. Um, okay. I worked on Crossrail and it was about, if I'm right, 15.5 billion. And um, currently it's gone beyond that. Wow, okay. I think it's about 17 billion now or so. But the reality, it happens everywhere. Yes, it does. You know, and the thing is, you need to have a tight ship to get your hold on cost. That's true. Um, because 
when I think about it, let's say I want to go into the market and I want to buy something, what, 100 naira, that's what I want to spend. And um, before I get into the market, I see one or two things and I start spending money. Um, I'd still need to bring out more money to buy the 100 naira thing. Yeah. So yeah. a plan has to be made on a tight ship of this is what the cost is and how do I have a breakdown of that. Um, and when you think about things that could make you um, a project cost a lot more or overrun your budget, you're thinking about procurement. And um, ideally, for most projects, you want to have a procurement strategy. How do you hope to procure people? Mm -hmm. um, I've worked on jobs whereby, you know, materials cost a lot. Mm -hmm. And what happened on the project was all the materials were bought and okay. it was paid for and put into storage. Wow. So that meant the two, three percent increase on buying it now and buying it in 18 months didn't come in. Didn't come in, yeah. So everything was bought and kept in storage. So that meant you knew you had all your materials and any other cost was outside that. So that Correct. meant, if you think like about price it, lockdown. You've got, yes, it's more of a lockdown thing. Um, and you think about, okay, so for some projects, you're talking about you're in some communities and the rest and things happen, maybe compensation and the rest. Well, those ones to me can come under risk. But you can only control the things you can control. Mm -hmm. Like things about your materials and things like that. And your contractors, uh, you know, pay them on, what I mean on time, agreeing a price. Yeah. And that to me is a major one because you don't want to pay them as, as things uh, as you go on along the project. Mm -hmm. And then you can see your costs going up. Because Sorry. for me, one of the biggest things on a project is the resources you're paying for. And how do you put that? Do you lock people down on contracts? Mm -hmm. And you know what your cost is. And you can actually have a forecast. And to me, um, I'm not too sure many jobs in Africa do the forecast. You of forecast course. what are you hoping to, what, what's your spend yes. for the next 18 months. Correct. And there you can actually see, um, does it look like I would and actually spend, go beyond what the budget is? So you start having those plans on time. And, 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 and also, you know, it also comes, it also impacts in fundraising. So what happens also is the fact that you find you going to an investor telling the investor, oh, I'm doing this uh, project, this uh, road project or whatever, it's going to cost me $20 million to get done and things. Okay, fine. You know, lenders, everybody goes together and, and you achieve your funding need. But it's not $25 million. You're not going back to them. Come on. They're going to like, they're yeah. going to eat you up. <laughs> so, so, so you, you typically, especially the lender, so you typically want to come up with a cost element that is high enough. Oh, yes. And a contingency at the same time that that you can just in case anything happens, I can always match it. You know, so you're right on the cost, but I feel also that the design from the very earlier slide you mentioned helps to actually um, you it helps you to actually pinpoint the cost. You know, early in early yeah, stage. Yeah, you can lock it down. It gives mm -hmm. you a good idea. Like there, you said, there's this tool called building information modeling. I don't know whether you know about it. Yeah, it's uh, a new phenomenon now or something. Yes, it is. I even uh, heard in the UK that infrastructure now has to be done through Beam. I've worked on a lot of projects um, where Beam has been part of it. Um, Gatwick Airport. Okay. It, it does work and it gives you an idea because you still have the BIM side of things that gives you the cost side of things. So you can okay. project um, program and time and cost. So you okay. actually know what you would spend. But there's still that factor of safety of I need to have 5% markup on that. Correct. And like yeah. I said, going back to the lenders every now and then, oh, I need a little bit more. You start exactly. looking a bit on oh, serious. Yes, yeah. exactly. So for me, uh, like I said, the design has to be, the cost has to be locked down at some stage, and then a contingency, because when you start having, okay, let's say, the price of cement going up, yeah, and, and when you think about how much of that you need, I'm thinking it should have been factored any days. Yeah. Then the, the other part is so when you have like an EPC contractor, say for like a port you're building or something, and you basically don't want variations but if you don't get the design done you know in a very detailed manner so are you can so we all can know what we are quoting for the contractor will tell you oh, i didn't quote for it oh, you yeah. know this is an afterthought and that's the beginning of your problems you know no you're right and um i know um 
a lot of projects I know in the UK have suffered one big thing, and that um, projects have started and the design is still coming on. Okay, that happens too. I heard about that. What, 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 did the, what is the rationale for that? Why did that happen? The rationale behind that is um, you, you've started a couple of works and you're thinking the design is ahead and mm -hmm. then you start construction. Then at some stage, maybe you realize a couple of things and you start redesigning some elements of it. But the only person who actually profits from that is a contractor because then yeah. the pricing, like you mentioned, pricing yeah. new things yeah. or the design is not speeding up as much as you think. Correct. And then construction gets up to the stage of where the um, design it has is. gotten up to. So, but you still have to pay the contractor while the design goes on. And the funny side is um, the quality of the design could be affected because you're trying to speed things up. Oh, wow. You know, wow. and those things, um, that means if it's not locked down, the costs start going up. Hmm. And um, to, to be frank, the construction industry in the world has the lowest rate of, if I'm right, um, success when it talks about um, achieving the target. It, it's okay. quite poor. Oh, okay. In the world, construction has the lowest percentage of um, success when it comes to projects. Oh, wow. Normally delayed the cost of a run, which tells you there's a fundamental issue. Hmm. Uh, it's not just Africa. Projects constantly overrun, cost, and also time. Yeah. So when yeah. you think about it, but for me, um, for Africa, it's easier to learn from the mistakes of others. That's true. That's you true. You know, so it's the person coming last. There's a lot more people to learn from. That's true. You know, um, the, the, there's a saying about I've forgotten what animal it was, and he had three kids, and um, the first one did something bad, and the mom said that wasn't good. Um, I think the question was how many times would something happen to you and you would learn? Mm -hmm. and the first child said three times, and <laughs> the second one said two times. And the last one said, um, I wouldn't wait for it to happen to me. I would learn from others. Okay. And that's where Africa is now. You yeah. can learn from projects that have failed. Mm -hmm. You know, we have enough examples to learn from. That's true. You true. know, and, and, and those are the things. And moving from costs, you know, one of the big ones is risk. Yeah. You know, um, what's risk? Um, you know, for me, it's just uncertainties. Things you, you can't know at all. But the key thing for me is, in Africa, like everywhere else, is risk. Um, and that's why, you know, looking for investors and the rest. Um, Having a risk register to me is key. Yeah, very important. And, um, and at, at, at very early stage too. Very early. And it, it's a live document. And for mm. me, um, the political situation of a country is a big risk. Yeah, yeah. You know, funding still remains a risk. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the lack of the right expertise is still a risk on a job. That's true. You know, so That's things true. like this, we know about them and we have to appreciate the fact that these things happen. And for me, risk in the African context or in the world context, you, you want to go from an unknown unknown to a known unknown. Okay. Um, Let's say there's an infrastructure project here and we just start building the rest. Um, we're not too sure what the conditions on the ground are like. We don't know, do we? No. Yeah, but that should, that should not be, an, as a national, have been something we should have looked at. Exactly. You know, and going back to the design, you want to have a lot of tests done, look at old maps and think about what's there. So we don't okay. know what the ground is all about. Let's do some surveys, let's do some analysis of the ground. You know, you, you have um, germ. Geotech, uh, geotechnic the kind of yeah. analysis. So you, you actually know what you're dealing with to an extent. Um, so at least you've done 50% of it. So you don't expose yourself to a lot more. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, um, on a lot of African projects, I, when you talk about risk, I'm of the opinion that the risk should be equally shared. Definitely, yeah. Because our parties. Look, looking at EPC projects, to have the EPC contractor take all the risk, to me, it's not quite right. Mm -hmm. Because I think when the client and the EPC contractor share the risk, there's more commitment to find ways of solving that. Everyone That's is, it, it, it's more about responsibility. If we share in the risk, that means we should also share in the gains. Mm -hmm. And we work towards working on that. So for me, 
putting money on the table and saying to the EPC contractor, that's it, go, you take the risk and give it to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a tendency that the EPC contractor would try to um, downplay the risk. Involved. That's true. That's because, true. you know, the risk is still the client. That's at the end of the day. It yeah. is. So you, you can't pay. Money on the table doesn't really pay for your risk. That's true. But money on the table can also help risk mitigation. And That's I, true. I keep thinking, that like we mentioned about resources, you need to have the right people in place. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, for me, the key thing about risk is there's a cost, there's an event, and there's an impact. What could happen that will impact my project? And you still think of what, what cost it, and what can happen? Um, one in a thousand year floods. It's a likelihood. That's true. You know, there was a big massive rainfall, was it last week, that flooded loads of areas. Mm -hmm. Those things, there's nothing wrong in thinking what's the worst case scenario. That could happen, yeah. Um, so when it comes to risk, it's not about being pessimistic, but think about what could happen. And for me, risk, you, there always has to be money equated to risk. Mm -hmm. You know, what's the likelihood that the community would say, we don't want this here again? That's true. Or we want this. So things like that have to be factored in. Um, and you know, for me, Africa, the risk is, for lots of people around the world, the risk is high. But once you meet to get this risk, you, and look at how to go around them, it becomes a, a lot easier for a project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and t um, going away from risk, um, for me, we've talked about the challenges and the rest, but yeah. I still think that like, people's expectations have to be managed. Are you talking about resources and the rest? Um, it, it applies everywhere. Um, it's like going back to the, to the lender um, to say, uh, I need more money. Mm -hmm. At some point, that discussion needs to be had. This is yeah. what's happening. Because if you're expecting me to deliver a job in two weeks, and I can't, and I know it's not possible, I, I need to let you know that in two weeks, it's not possible. So That's true. expectations, and one of the key things for me is, um, it, it's not great if your expectations are higher than your aspirations. Yeah. Because yeah. your expectations have to be, it has to be realistic. Mm -hmm. Your aspirations could be more, it's a lot higher, and if you achieve your expectation and your aspiration, great. Yeah. But you yeah. still need to keep people informed. What's the quality of what you're getting? When are you getting it? Exactly. Or this would cost more because um, uh, let's say I want a chair made and you tell me, okay, you'll be ready. It, it will cost you 100 naira. If at some point you come back to me and say it would be 200 it's not quite right yeah you know, so these things and for me it still goes back to communication because um i remember reading somewhere that the biggest one of the biggest problems i found this shocking but mm -hmm. one of the biggest problems on projects is lack of soft skills okay we're talking about communication, communication yeah and and when i read the article it dawned on me uh, even coming to thinking about expertise and the rest it, it's soft skills of interaction between people and how does that work we have a lot more projects to learn from people have to talk to each other that's true. you know and that to me it's a key thing but it sounds very simple but it is a key thing and it goes back to stakeholders people need to be engaged mm -hmm. And you know what people's expectations are, you know. Mm -hmm. I want a room that's painted white and I walk in and it's red. You know, that wasn't what I wanted. Exactly. exactly. You're right. You're right. I think it's also key for for expectations to be managed pretty much also on the client side. Um, if you look at the whole infrastructure, like, you know, funding structure where you have your client, uh, the project SPV, you have your lenders, you have your your um, contractors and things the biggest um, hurdle is the money we have put together please deliver that infrastructure deliver that asset let us see yeah that the, the asset was not delivered you know to any of the parties it, the project is a failure oh so yes any abandoned project is a waste of time we, we, it's better we didn't even do it from the first place than to have gotten it halfway so I agree to the fact that um, I agree to the fact that it's it's really important, and I also feel that communication of having 
you know, more workshops or more meetings. Sometimes email, everything is email, 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 email. People get tired, like, you know what, what exactly is happening? So you even get lost in the mail trail. So why not just have a meeting or a workshop together every two weeks? If it's a project that is a large scale project, we need to all see, you know, have verbal talk about it and let's know what the issues are. And as you mentioned, you know, when you when you don't share the risks appropriately with the contractor, he tends to hide some risk from you. Oh, okay. yeah. and that's right. Because if you think about it, um, a lot of people actually have workshops and they get people to sit there um, and talk about the project. This is not just one team. These are various people. And they yeah. Do, well, maybe have a retreat and talk about the project. Exactly. And, and, and to be frank, I, I read a book called Culture Code and it talked about winning teams. Yeah. Why is it some teams are great at winning things? And one of the things was working as a team whereby people sit down together and go through issues. And sometimes the clear line between the client and the contractor is not there. Yeah. And people commit to things. And at the end of the day, the obstructions are, are, are go, they go away and people kind of pull into a table. That's true. So it's part of that breaking the communication barriers there and people sit down and talk about things. And you'll be shocked um, how much can be done. But I still think we can't run away from the life of advisory, you know. um, um, what would I say, consultants. Mm -hmm. And they are there to play a key role. Definitely. And I think the opportunity, like I mentioned about the UK NIAF thing, people have to accept that you do need help mm -hmm. with people who know who've done it before and there's nothing like be an external person looking onto your project because when you're on a project it's more like a tunnel vision you need someone else to guide you on what to do mm -hmm. and, you, and you can't run away from that mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. is a key thing for me that also helps that's why most big projects are never made up of one team yeah yeah. It's made up of different consultancies work, and that's where the world is now. Correct. But it's not possible to really have a client. Not like it's not possible. Impossible is not the. Way. It's more like you have a client that has all the right expertise in them. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It's hard to really get that right, and that's where the world of consultancies, consultants, exactly. Comes in. Advice. You, you know, understand. and you have to ask for help. That's true. You know, that's there's true. nothing wrong in asking for help, and it's about questions. Um, if I remember clearly, there's an evil saying that goes like this. If you ask questions, you never get lost. That's true. That's true. So mm -hmm. the life of consultants and advisory people, people who have done it, people who know it. Exactly. Exactly. It's a reality. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, to kind of conclude, okay. um, does, does, we still have, um, I wouldn't say a long way, but I think we need to pause and look at the infrastructure and think we've had projects that have failed or failing and what do we need to do because um, if you do the same thing the result would never change correct yeah and we need to step back and look at the projects and think how do we get this going mm -hmm. you know and also thinking about we still need to have policies in place to help infrastructure projects carry on because that remains one of the key things because i still think there are funds for projects the funds is not the issue again definitely funds are there um i, I remember going to um an event uh, that was organized by the dutch government and um, you have the likes of the european bank afc and the rest there and then you just get to understand that funds are available mm -hmm. but the thing is you Projects need to come with a good idea, something realistic. Mm -hmm. What do you need to have in place to get the project done? Exactly, exactly. And, and that's the way it would go. So what policies do you need in place? It's not when you get to the, um, when you get to the hurdle, you start thinking, we need those policies or those concessions in place. It, it's too late in the day. And I, I wouldn't blame the government if at a stage, you come looking for policies or bills in place to help a project and they go no because you should have known this well enough if mm -hmm. you had thought the loop that's the thing no that's just wake up and say i need that because even if you think of it ideally there should be you know thinking of nigeria or africa there should be right of ways existing already yeah and you think about it there's nothing wrong in tapping into this existing right of ways yeah there's an existing infrastructure which you can pick a bank on 
yeah you know things like that so it, it's more like a web going from the from the center correct and, and these things are the only way that the trans and for me the return on investment with the population of africa um population of nigeria it's amazing really and the more right. you move people around i think the more people become more productive mm -hmm. and even if you think about it we we'll spend less on things not working you know it's like goods are more expensive because of transportation issues Definitely. so you can imagine if you remove that bottleneck and there's free transportation that means people get to places quicker goods get to places quicker yeah well yeah. the thing is the story has to make sense and we need to fill in the blank spaces and it's about stepping back and thinking about it and thinking the loop through and putting those boxes into place yeah okay so um Now, so that, I mean, thank you for the very, very nice presentation and discussions. Now we go into the few Q&A, even though I've been, you know, discussing all along, you know, in itself. So a, a key thing I would like us to share is China. And China seems to have this knack for, you know, doing high-speed rails and things like that. And they get it done, you know, pretty much fast, you know, maybe because it's a socialist society, you know, and, you know, you can't just... Um, be too corrupt even though they have some corrupt people but i mean you, you you have to really be very very mindful of yourselves that is there any lessons africa can take from china in executing you know large case rail and and maybe uh port projects so to say um for me um china's done well for themselves but if you look back at china you can see what we're seeing now is the result of what took many years to get to. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and like I say, um, I think it's a mal um, a child has to crawl before the walk. That's true. If a child crawls for too long, the walking stage starts very late. That's true. You know, but I, I doubt that any child will be born, and as they're born, they don't crawl. Yeah. That would be a bit shocking. But, exactly. But but if you think about it, um, we have to be realistic, and we have to start from up the ladder so for me um, things like high speed um, it would be great okay I would want mm -hmm. high speed mm -hmm. but there's still, the basic one. there's still a lot more to, to get do. to that stage That's um, true. That's true. because mind you um, even the Romans went on horses and carts um, before they progressed and we still have to go through that because if you go beyond where you're meant to step the whole thing will crumble mm -hmm. so we still need to and, and i think what africa is facing now is what other continents have faced in so it, it's a days. it's a stage that it's exactly. not there's nothing now happening that's new but we st we can still learn from others mm -hmm. and we could s kind of skip a couple of steps correct and for me we would get to the china to the state of china definitely, definitely. we will but it, it's appreciating the fact that we have to take that gradual look and look at things and, and the step to get there well if we can get the roads walking um mm -hmm. think about real try to get people off the roads mm -hmm. you know going back to the design because some of these roads are not built think about are not really built for the, what they carry you know yeah. the, the tankers and the rest I'm exactly not, because ideally if a road is meant to carry or uh, the tankers and the trucks that means ideally the load must have been the load used must have been that for the tanker plus a factor exactly but not if a road is built for cars and it's exactly kind of, you know the road wouldn't last long exactly the, the, the other question that also comes to mind is um i mean a number of our listeners may be involved in projects that um are of this scale from a transport infrastructure perspective either government or private sector but what is the number one thing you think uh among all the factors you've mentioned, cost, risk, um, issues related to the, the life cycle itself, which one would you regard as the one they must not miss, that they must actually get that ready? Or, or they must hammer on their most time? Oh, that's or everything? That, that's a, it, it's everything, but if you say, uh, everything is there, it's critical, but if you think about it for me, I will go for stakeholders. Okay. okay. I will go for stakeholders because um, I think from the stakeholders you can branch into the rest. 
Yeah, it's yeah. key because, yeah. as the word says, stakeholders, you know, it, they have an interest and a concern in it. That's and true. I think it's everybody in there. That's and true. everyone on the table wants it to be a success. So to me, stakeholders is key and they have to be carried along. That's true. That's because true. if you neglect any of them, it comes back to haunt you. That's true. That's true. And, 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 and there was a time in Lagos, you know, one of the past governors, we've had this Fort Midland Bridge um, that, you know, traversed a number of villages and towns in Lagos. And um, I think a concession agreement was signed about a year or two years ago. But it was later cancelled for a number of, I don't know, for whatever reasons. And um, it, it just brings your point of stakeholders. I, I don't know what happened. Maybe the, the, the concessionaire was not communicating well with the government or the investors are not well informed or even the, 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 the areas where the bridge is meant to pass and things. So, so you are right on stakeholders. Um, so what's the way forward now in Nigeria? I mean, you've been a Niger person, you've done work in the UK, you know, you've done various infrastructure. Um, we have, you know, a huge amount of deficits, you know, which we are all aware of. But if you were to speak to President Buhari today, that, okay, Mr. Buhari, this is what you need to do. What would that be? <laughs> I doubt I would have the chance to do that. <laughs> yeah, but... To be frank, it, it's um, it's easy to say that, but it's a hard one. But in, in the transport in the transport concept, in, yeah. in the transport con concept, to be frank, um, I think we need to go back to the drawing table. Correct. Go back to the drawing table, and um, I love analogies, but um, I recall doing a driving test, and the driving instructor said to me, "You need to start driving like you've never driven before." Okay. So for me, we need to go back to the um, drawing table and start afresh and forget the bad habits and things that haven't worked and exactly. say, let's start from ground zero. How do we do this? How do we make a project work? Correct. There are enough examples around us. How do we look at all the things, the funding mechanism, the life, life cycle, and look at the, these things? Forget my past experiences. Exactly. Let's get a model that's not affected and, by. And, and, and you're right on that because there's no road or there's no rail system or any infrastructure that has been built in Nigeria today that is accommodating the population we have today. Oh, I agree. So, so you have to start from scratch. It's like go and check any road is congested, not because of sometimes not even because the road is bad, but there's just too much influx, you know. Um, you look at airports, you know, there are no areas, the whole place is run down, you know. So, you are right on the fact that we have to start from day one. And I think that's the thing the president should also look at. For me, um, I will also say this from a point of view of, of, of developers. You know, when you have opportunities to, to work with a concession authority, Maybe a state government is giving you a right to develop an airport or a road or a rail or what kind of transport infrastructure or ports and things. Don't feel happy getting away with a flimsy concession agreement or a flimsy three-page MOU. Oh, I have an MOU with the governor. I'm, I'm doing it. No, no, no. Don't be happy. In fact, you should be worried that, come, they've given me the right to do this thing. I don't even have... A detailed agreement that has proper terms, proper liquidated damages, and proper. We've not even negotiated it just because I know the governor or I know the minister is my friend and things. So it, 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 it will come back to hurt you because one is you had the opportunity to actually negotiate a decent contract from day one, but because you have um, you're so joyous about the whole opportunity. You collected this, you know, five-page document that is a nice MOU, go and develop the port or go and do this, but does not really spell out what exactly is government meant to do. Now, you, you go happy, you come to a brickstone or you come to someone like Chukudi, oh, I have this port thing, and, and you look at the, the, the agreement of the port, and it, it's really sad. And the guy can't even go back to the minister or go back to whoever gave him the agreement that, see, this agreement can't hold water. So, yeah. in, 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 an important part is, very early, 
you need to find the right legal you know advice uh, and make sure that even though you have the connect let me use that word yeah or you have the ability to see through that concession rights right either through procurement or whatever make sure they go through the right documentation it will help you in the long run you may feel that you are getting away with a, a project but at the end of the day what are what are investors investing in they are investing in the rights that you have claimed for the assets and that right is written in a black and white paper that is what they will take to court in terms of conflict that's what they will use to um discuss with your investors you know to raise money in, in, into your project whether it's a port or an airport and things so i, I think that that is for me an important lesson for what you've mentioned that you know the scope especially the form of contract which you mentioned there is that well that is key the, 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 the heart of this agreement is the project agreement itself where the concession authority has given you a right to develop an airport don't take it that don't take it um, on the platter of gold that he, he said it and I'm going to go and do it. You need to now make him work at it. By the time he sees the risk, he, the government himself has to um, take upon themselves. He will at him twice that, oh, wow, I think, I think we, we should, should we still give you this effort to do or, <laughs> or we should give it to someone else. So, so, so those are the things where we think there's a lot of lack in 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 the transport infrastructure space um i mean all my years you know consulting for clients i've seen people come to our office with a, an airport a cargo airport people have come to our offices with a port you know in ghana or in nigeria or elsewhere in africa but the the basis upon agreeing to those terms do not hold water they do not also provide the, the risk mitigation framework upon which any you know infrastructure finance can be can be relied upon. So don't have like my own just closing remarks in it. So I don't know whether you have but, but anything. Okay, go ahead. I understand what you're saying, but if you think about it, there's a massive shortfall in infrastructure projects in Africa in Nigeria. Yes. We're talking about close to forty billion dollars. Even more. Oh well, yeah, well, you well, know, well, and, yeah, and, well, and the population yeah. is increasing in yeah. Nigeria, Africa. Because if I recall, um, Africa 50, um, an infrastructure investment platform, I, I think it's um, yeah, it's backed by the a AFDB. Yes, yes. They've actually estimated that infrastructure fund needed in Africa should be about 1.2 trillion for the period, I, I think it's 2017 to 2025. Wow. Or about $150 billion a year. Okay. But mind you, there's a shortfall of about $40 billion. Okay. So if you think about it, it's still a lot of, sh the shortfall is a lot. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. It, it's a lot. So some people, maybe with the right intention in quotes, are thinking, yes, let's build an airport there where it's not needed. Exactly. That's, um, it's an infrastructure project, but it, it, it is a waste. So it's, there's also an issue of risk allocation, allo sorry, portfolio allocation. Allocate the right projects to the right space or the right business case that you've mentioned there must be an economic reason for having oh, yes that force. yes there's no it's not a, a bright a lovely structure is not really exactly what we want to see um, exactly it's something that's functional it, it's usable it makes sense to the economy mm -hmm. it does what the business case is because if you don't if you have a good project then the business case is not utilized or achieved the aims and objectives are not achieved yeah, then right. it doesn't it doesn't make sense mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right then um, thank you all um, and just as a quick final um, where we started the initial talk you know we spoke about our upcoming deal camp series for Brickstone it's happening on the 22nd and 23rd of November 2019 um, the venue is Mikhail the Moore House Ikoi Lagos um, it will involve um, entrepreneurs understanding the practical issues risk and challenges in developing large-scale projects and I think um, it's important you know you'll be there um, you can click on the link below this um, video to to learn more about it or you go to our website brickstone.africa you know to find out more and thank you once again and thank you mr. Chikudi pleasure right. is mine thank you for All having right. me bye